Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to get started here this afternoon. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Jesse Stolark. I'm a policy associate at the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And thanks for joining us. Um, and thank you for all of you watching online. We have a very exciting program this afternoon on the Farm Bill Energy Title. The Energy Title, which was first introduced in the 2002 Farm Bill, is just a small piece of the overall Farm Bill. Yet, as I hope we'll hear today, this relatively modest federal investment has had outsized benefits to rural economic development. We have a great panel for you this afternoon with representatives from a number of companies that show the enormous reach these programs have, and they range from renewable energy to energy efficiency, renewable chemicals, fuels, and products, and we're in luck because they also brought some samples for us to look at. We'll also hear from them about ways these programs can continue to evolve to create better economic opportunities and environmental outcomes. So before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. I would be remiss not to recognize our partner in planning this briefing, the Agriculture Energy Coalition. The coalition was formed just in the lead up to the 2014 Farm Bill to advocate for the diverse ag energy and renewable energy interests in rural communities and has really been a leader in this space. And EESI is a supporting member, and the leader of the coalition, Lloyd Ritter, is here if you have any questions for him. And then if you were not aware of us, EESI was founded over 30 years ago by a bipartisan congressional caucus, but now serves as an independent nonprofit. And you can check out our website to find out more information about this particular topic, as well as look at all of our past briefings, fact sheets, and newsletters, and other items. So, oh. Before we get started, I just want to briefly introduce our speakers. You have their bios in front of you, and for those of you watching online, if you go to the briefings page, you can find them as well. But I'll just quickly introduce them, and then I'm going to turn it over to them, because we have a lot, a lot to get through in a relatively short amount of time. So first up, we're going to have John Sagrati. John is the Biomaterials Business Development Manager at DuPont Industrial Biosciences. We have John Shaw, the President of I Idaconics Corporation. We have Sarah Bajas, Director of Communications and Governmental Affairs at ReEnergy Holdings. We have Scott Koi Hoon, co-founder and senior vice president of Aloterra. We have Graham Christensen, a Nebraska farmer and president of GC Resolve. And last but not least, we have James Duffy, a partner at Nixon Peabody, and here today representing the Distributed Wind Energy Association. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sagrati. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. As you heard, I'm uh, John Sagrati with uh, DuPont. I've been at DuPont for 33 years and uh, primarily in green products. And today I'm going to be talking about within the uh, Farm Bill Energy Title Program, there's a bio-based markets program. And this program, uh, Section uh, 9002, was around pr helping provide value for commodities. I don't know if, if, how familiar you are with this, but a bio-based product is anything that's derived from plants or other renewable materials. And uh, so this could be ag, forest products, crops. This can go into lubricants, detergents, polymers, lots of different things. So it's an alternative to petroleum. and. Um, DuPont and the government, we've been a strong supporter of this for many years. DuPont made a commitment quite a while ago to be always looking for greener, better solutions and taking our polymers and our materials and deriving them from agricultural-based products made a lot of sense for both the environment and also from business. So we've been a strong supporter of this because what this program within this title program is something called the Bio Preferred Label and mandatory purchasing. And so what that means is that the USDA will go and third party accredit that, yeah, this actually is something that's made bio-based. So this helps provide credibility and visibility to bio-based products. Oh, I have the clicker. Let's see. There we go. So to give you a little bit of background on DuPont and what we consider to be successful, the first thing is three pillars for success in biomaterials. And the first one is to have a genuine innovative science to produce high performance materials. P 
people, there's still a bit of a stigma. If it comes from bio, if it's natural, it's probably inferior. Uh, the detergent maybe doesn't clean as well. Or, so there's this stigma, and we've always believed that it's just the opposite. This is an opportunity to actually make superior products because the molecules are different. And so we've been able to, it's, as to us, we won't pursue it unless we genuinely have a differentiated high performance. The next thing is scalable supply. What's the point of making a great product if you can't afford it? So if we can't get to scale and we can't get the cost to where it's really going to move the needle, there's also not a lot of point in doing it. So this is also very important. And last is the renewable sourcing aspect to it. We view this to be very crucial. Uh, we provide a lot of science and, and partnerships in being able to use renewable materials as the starting point. And that gets to the responsibility piece, you know, what really is a responsible material. Before I go in too deep on that, let me talk just real briefly around at the core of our biomaterials business is a, it's basically an alcohol. It's a special type of alcohol, has a fancy name, 1,3-propendiol. Um, you're all familiar with beer and wine. That's a fermentation process in which a natural biomass material is converted into ethanol. And this is pretty much the same thing. The only difference is the organism in there, instead of turning it into ethanol, it makes a special alcohol, a diol, called propendiol, or PDO as we call it. So this bio-PDO is very unique in that it can do a lot of things in replacement of, of glycols and other petroleum-based types of materials. First of all, what we do is we start with a, with a biomass feedstock, and this can be any crop, and it's, it's starches are what we typically start with. So we're looking for efficient land use ways of, of getting at a starch. And so we'll start with a starch and the sugars in there, and we'll convert that using fermentation. And if you think about it, and say if you wanted to make like a nylon, you know, you're going to take oil and you're going to boil that and make benzene and cook that to make caprolactam and cook that some more to make a polymer. Well, when you do fermentation, you pretty much just pitch the yeast and let it go. So from an energy reduction standpoint, this is very significant. You know, you're looking 60% less greenhouse gas emission than a nylon. So these processes kind of are self-running and it's, it's pretty cool. So not only is the product itself very unique, but the process itself is, is, is extremely friendly. So we can, first of all, we can take that bio-PDO and we can use that directly either in cosmetics. Zamiya is the brand name for that. So that's used as a humectant, which is, it holds moisture. So you can use that in moisturizers and, and uh, pharmaceutical household cleaners, even food and flavorings. It's a very benign thing uh, and it's, it's a naturally occurring, it's, it's an alcohol. So, um, so that's one way of using it. The other way of using the bio PDO directly under the brand name Sistera is you can also use it in polymer resins, which I'll talk about in a second. Also heat transfer fluids, uh, your, your planes, if uh, they're de-iced, there's a good chance I had the de-icing fluid now. It's a much better uh, and, and better for the environment and safer chemical. So it's one of the other ways of using it. So you can take this bio PDO and you can react it further to make a polymer. And so that's what we call Serona. And pretty soon actually you'll start to see hang tags in the store of Serona. We've been partnering with a lot of well-known brands like North Face and Burton and L.L. Bean. And these are people that vet and take very seriously the environmental footprint, which is why we've, we've found a very good partnership. So these products later on, if you want to come up, I can show you examples. Replacement for animal hair for makeup brushes, Mohawk carpets, which is a large residential carpet maker out there. And uh, so beautiful carpets. Even interesting things like taking it and spinning it into foam replacements is a very lightweight cushion. So a lot of interesting uses because the polymer itself is genuinely unique. So that's an idea of these materials that we're playing with, just to kind of give you a case example. We have more in the pipeline that we're coming out with. So this is our, our current one that's, that's commercial. So when we talk about responsible materials, there's a couple elements to it. First is, is to be environmentally responsible. And that's going to, first of all, you know, if, if you're looking at your feed source, you're finding things that are incredibly efficient. You know, as we, we, we carefully vet what feedstocks we're using, where they're from, to make sure that it's the most efficient source, the best on land use, water use. Uh, the plants themselves, we usually use sugar. Uh, you know, in this example, we're using sugars. So we're going to look at which plants efficiently convert uh, energy in, into sugar. And innovation is, is a key piece in there. So the, the, not only environmentally, but also socially responsible is also another key piece in this whole thing. And so that's 
products and chemicals that are safe and benign to the human body, uh, geopolitically stable. And, you know, we always joke we'd much rather have the kids going out in cornfields than, than other fields, you know, in order to protect this, this, uh, this source of a raw material. So just politically, geopolitically, a lot more stable to be coming from an agricultural base. And the key thing, once you have this material, the other thing is if people don't know about it, it's going to be hard to select it and purchase it. And that's what we get to with the BioPreferred program. And uh, so it needs to be identifiable, so, and it needs to be publicized and promoted, because there's a lot of greenwashing. It's hard to really know what you're actually buying. There are plenty of products out there, and especially working in the field, sometimes my eyes just roll as I see some of the things that are, that are out there and being claimed green. But the great thing about this program is, is that this is a third-party validation that, yes, in fact, this is uh, a bio-based material, and so we use this as a proof point uh, in our marketing and literature, and, uh, and so we can be found on, if you want to know what products are bio-based, you can go on the USDA bio-preferred site and you can see which ones are, uh, are genuinely certified as bio-based. So it's, it's not just people talking, but the key is, is that we've got, we've got validation and we have promotion. And that's pretty much it. John? Uh, hi, my name is John Shaw. I'm the uh, president of Idaconics Corporation. Um, is a company that uh, actually uh, was founded in 2008. Uh, as a spin-off out of uh, technology that was developed by the University of New Hampshire for polymerizing, polymerizing idaconic acid, which I don't necessarily expect you to understand, but I'll give you uh, uh, some important pointers about why it's important. So we are a small company. Uh, we were uh, privately funded for many years. We merged with a UK-based uh, specialty polymer company about two years ago. Uh, that has now took our name, so Idaconics PLC is actually a UK-based, publicly traded company uh, working on specialty polymers. We're the world leader in polymers of idaconic acid. Uh, idaconic acid is a naturally occurring uh, metabolite. Uh, actually, your body produces it, um, but commercially it's used, it's been a bit of a holy grail uh, to make polymers of it since uh, at least the 1960s. Um, the first patent filed on it was by Pfizer uh, in 1960 to, uh, it was about a 36-hour polymerization process to get to an 80% yield, so it was not viable. Uh, around that same time, uh, Procter & Gamble filed the first patent on the use of polyadiconic acid in cleaners, uh, showing that it had superior performance to sodium tripolyphosphates. So for 60 years, people have been looking uh, for uh, this kind of holy grail of a polymer, but it wasn't producible. There was another attempt by Roman Haas in 1993. They got it down to about a 10-hour process, still not economically viable. Um, and we were founded in 2008 as a spinoff out of the University of New Hampshire because our, our technical founder, uh, Dr. Yvonne Durant, was able to get to a commercial process that took to less than an hour to get to 100% yield. So about 10 years ago, the whole area of potential uh, for using this product uh, in, uh, commercially was made available. Idaconic acid was already used uh, broadly, um, through, uh, produced by fermentation. When we started the company, there was a, a three plants in the world. Uh, one is that uh, Cargill produced it at its citric acid plant in Eddyville, Iowa, and then there were two plants in China. Uh, do, since we're talking today about the effect that governments can have uh, on, your, uh, on your development of your company, the first hit we had was in 2009. Uh, the federal government, uh, may sound familiar, put actually an import tariff on citric acid coming in uh, from abroad, uh, from both Canada and China. So citric acid prices went up, uh, and uh, Cargill started making so much money at citric acid that they decided to no longer make idaconic acid. Um, that was a bad day in the development of our company because now we were relegated to only having overseas shipments of idaconic acid from two very good producers in China. Um, but in terms of our product development, 
Uh, many of the potential uses for our product were limited because our potential customers would not accept the supply chain where the itaconic acid was coming across from, uh, from abroad. Uh, and whether it, and we have hundreds of applications, but if, say, if you're a large brand, putting your large brand at risk when there wasn't a domestic supply of your raw material was difficult. So we immediately had to change our, our product strategy and focus on smaller applications where the integrated supply of itaconic acid uh, was not required. Our ambition is to come back and we have the full capabilities to ferment itaconic acid ourselves. And our key one for us as a small company is that we get financial support um, in the way of loan guarantees, uh, the extending the loan guarantees that biofuel companies get for us to have a domestic supply of itaconic acid. It's about a $30 million investment to do at least uh, very difficult to raise that kind of money, and it's critical to get domestic supply to be able to grow it again, is to have these kind of programs available to us. So again, uh, we make a novel renewable polymer uh, that has great customer value. Um, we focused on detergents uh, when uh, back, moved our focus to detergents in 2009, and we've been extremely successful in that area. Um, what the, uh, the first one is our, our key product is a water-soluble polymer of itaconic acid that's a leading replacement uh, for the next generation of non-phosphate detergents. Uh, phosphates have been regulated out of detergents uh, because the uh, discharge into the environment uh, is the phosphate ends up being a source of uh, food for algae. The algae grow. They cut off oxygen supply, and you have bad rivers and bad lakes. So regular, uh, the, actually, the U.S. has been very, actually fairly aggressive in non-phosphate ones. Some of the non-phosphate is just coming into Europe, uh, but we work primarily in Europe and North America into non-phosphate non detergents as the key replacement for it. Um, the, uh, it we have tremendous growth in, uh, in the use of our products. We're in about 45 uh, different end-user consumer products right now. Uh, everything from Clorox Greenworks to uh, Method products, Planet Automatic Dish Detergents. Uh, the one up here is actually in private label. Uh, if you go to a Lowe's store, the private label automatic dish detergent, I actually worked on formulating that. We did the full formulation to get out on the market. About 50% of our sales are in North America, 50% of our sales are in Europe, half are in automatic dish detergent and half are in laundry detergents. Um, and again, as the best replacement for phosphates to still have that level of performance. Um, we do all, we have a broad range of capabilities. Uh, one of the key ones for us is the potential to make 100% uh, bio-based and biodegradable super absorbent to go into diapers. That's a big program for us to develop going forward. Again, uh, an area that's difficult because the, once you get into it, the demand is so high that you have to have a very large plant to even start supplying into it. Um, just to give a sense, we're about a 30-person company, roughly split between the UK and here. We've been growing uh, fairly significantly on it, uh, and it's a tremendous opportunity for additional uh, employment growth as we expand to new areas. Talk a little bit about the challenges that you have. For us, is demonstrating the value of a new material to go into an end product is a very time-consuming process. You don't just walk into a large detergent manufacturer and say, here, go try this. It's a multi-year process, significant amount of testing, a long investment in technical uh, support and, and evaluations to get into it. And that's critical for us is where most of our funding goes. Um, but at the same time, you can't get into it unless you have a reliable supply. So as you're developing that, you still have to put a plant in place. And, you, and in doing so, uh, it's very capital intensive. So the availability of funding uh, is that no, no one wants to give it to you. Your customers don't want to give it to you. Uh, you know, every, you're always searching around to try to find the funding for it. And that's where the expansion of the Section 9003 uh, program for biofuels, extending it into renewable chemicals is critical to us. Uh, as it stands right now in the current farm bill, uh, these kind of supports are available uh, for renewable biomass, primarily advanced uh, biofuels such as ethanol, into, into gasoline, that's a pretty commodity one. It's kind of replacement of just you know, bio-based for gasoline side of it. But we have much better and higher objectives to achieve within the farm bill. One is to go after safer chemicals, and second of all, to go on that is ones that have less environmental impact uh, and less accumulation in it. So for safer chemicals, 
For example, our polyadiconic acid is much safer to replace phosphates. Another good example is nanocellulose is used to replacement of formaldehydes in everything from uh, the glues that are used for, for wood composites, where the formaldehyde comes out into your house, into, your, uh, into the environment, and is harmful. There are great green chemical replacements that are much safer. In addition, if you look at the environmental impact side of it, Biodegradable polylactic acid and PHA packaging is a highly valuable area where we don't get plastics going out into the environment and persisting the environment. Um, and then also for us, a goal for us is to have a fully biodegradable superabsorbent diaper. Um, to do this though, we need to, these are much higher value added products um, than just looking at biofuels. Um, they create tremendous amount of value. We tremendous amount of value create a huge amount of job opportunities. But to do this, we need the same benefits that the biofuel companies have had to build plants and extend them off into renewable chemicals. And that's critical for us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Bogues. I work for ReEnergy Holdings, and ReEnergy owns and operates biomass to electricity plants in the Northeast. And I am pleased today to provide an update on one of the ongoing BCAP projects, and we are known as BCAP Project Area 10. And this is a project that was awarded back in 2012. I have very fond memories of a beautiful day in July of 2012 when Senator Gillibrand came up to a farm in central New York in the town of Mexico to announce this USDA award to support the commercialization of shrub willow in central and northern New York. And this was a partnership between us and the College of Environmental Science and Forestry, which is a college that is part of the State University of New York. It's located in Syracuse, and they were really the driver of this particular BCAP project. There is a faculty member at ESF by the name of Tim Volk, and he is, I would say, an international expert on shrub willow, and he has devoted his entire 30-plus year career to studying shrub willow. So he was eager to partner with us to see if we would provide an end market for shrub willow under the terms of a BCAP project. So this slide um, includes the, um, like the project elements of, of uh, Project Area 10. USDA designated the project area in central and northern New York that would allow the expansion of shrub willow on biomass crops on marginal land. So this was land that was lying fallow, and um, Tim Volk could not work with these landowners to begin commercializing shrub willow unless these landowners could have the wherewithal to not only establish these crops, but then also to have an end market to sell the crops. So ReEnergy committed to purchase all of the willow that these landowners could plant over an 11-year period. At this time, we have about 1,200 acres in three counties that are enrolled in the program, and more than 8,500 tons of willow have been delivered to our plants from the commencement of the project in 2013 until the present. So, you know, our facility managers, managers at our two plants in northern New York, you know, there were some fits and starts in terms of how to blend that fuel into ours, but over time, it was determined that it was a suitable, suitable fuel in terms of moisture and ash content, and it's worked out well. It tends to come every fall, and at this point, we are using it exclusively at our ReEnergy Black River plant, which is inside the fence at Fort Drum. And Fort Drum is a very large U.S. Army installation outside of Watertown, New York, and under the terms of a 20-year renewable energy supply agreement, we are providing all of Fort Drum's electricity needs with our renewable electricity. So I think it's pretty neat that this BCAP project is allowing these landowners to use their marginal land to supply fuel to support a mission-critical inst installation like Fort Drum. So some of the benefits of the program, as I've mentioned, um, it overcomes the barriers of the high upfront cost to establish the crops. 
creates stable long-term end markets. It advances Tim Volk's research. It provides fuel diversity benefits to us at ReEnergy. Um, we tend to use um, mill residue and forest residue, and this was a way to add some diversity to that fuel mix, which is always a good thing from our perspective. It also supports jobs and rural development, and Tim Volk has, has pointed out two studies to me that says that between 45 and 59 jobs are supported for every 10,000 acres of the cultivation of this crop. Um, we also have been providing extension services to landowners, and that's been through the BCAP program, but also through $400,000 from the New York State Energy and Research Development Authority. So we were pleased to see New York State also get into the act and support this program. And this has allowed the farmland to stay as farmland. Oh, and Carrie from the Biomass Power Association wanted me to point out that BCAP could really be helpful to Western New York, where they are, as you know, really struggling with forest fire risk, and that BCAP could fund the collection and transportation of biomass to the plants that are making use of that fuel out in California. Thank you. Okay, hi, Scott Coyhune with Alatera. Um, so first of all, I have to say uh, happy birthday to my wife who may be watching this on the webinar. Uh, so Erica, happy birthday. Um, I'm sure you know you really wanted your husband talking about policy and BCAP in DC for your birthday present, so here we are. Um, I, I wanted to start out with um, a thank you to Kelly Novak and Matt Ponish, Todd Atkinson, and, and Darlene uh, Freeman, all with the FSA. Uh, those are the individuals that put in monster hours for our company to get this project up off the ground. And, uh, oops, I guess I need to do this. Yeah, there we go. Um, and without their work, um, this, this, would have, this would have never happened. And so that extends to everybody in this room. You know, as you're working on these policy issues, the message that I want to get across today is that what you're doing does make a difference. And I'm going to give you some statistics here that this is, this is starting to have an impact in, in rural America. And um, I hope to give you a little glimmer of my vision of tens of thousands and even millions of jobs that uh, a project like BCAP could launch in the next, the next few decades. So uh, what, what BCAP does is it provides a subsidy to the farmer to plant the crop. Uh, it provides a rent payment to the farmer uh, while they're waiting for the crop to mature, and it provides a matching payment for the crop after it's harvested to subsidize the, the harvesting cost. The reason this is important is because what we're trying to do is commercialize plants that haven't been commercial before. We're trying to bring a new corn or a new soybean into the market. When we started this process, uh, miscanthus is a sterile plant. It has no seed. So we have to dig these rhizomes out of the ground. We've got to put them in cold storage, pull them back out of cold storage, and put them back in the ground again using specialized equipment. It costs about $1,500 an acre. That's a complete non-starter in farming. So what the BCAP program did is allowed us to get that cost to about $500 an acre. Um, it's a 20-year crop. So just over 10 years, you're looking at $50 an acre. And, and now we're talking about a crop that, that has a, a chance in the market. Um, Time is a, is a really big issue in BCAP. So if you're a farmer and you may have just paid a bunch of money to put this perennial crop into your ground, or maybe it was subsidized by BCAP, you still have to wait two, three, four, five years for it to mature. And, and you just you can't do that waiting for revenue. Um, so the, the rent payment is a big deal to the farmers, and, and it's what got, got uh, our farmers involved. We actually didn't have uh, an end-use contract when we started this project, and we signed up 4,000 acres in 90 days. Uh, using marginal land in Northeast Ohio and Northwest Pennsylvania. And the reason we were able to do that was because uh, BCAP reduced the risk significantly uh, on planting and allowed the farmer to get a, a small payment on rent. The last piece is critical mass. Um, well, let me not, not skip over uh, the investor issue in time. I can't go to the investment community and say, hey, I need $5 million to plant four or 5,000 acres and I need you to wait three or four years, and then I'm going to build you a manufacturing facility, and then a couple years later, we're going to start to generate revenue. It's, it's a complete non-starter. So uh, the role of BCAP is to get that raw material supply chain going, and then the market, the private market, can come in with our investments in manufacturing, and we can bring this thing home. And so that's obviously pretty important. Uh, critical mass. 
um, 500 acres, 1,000 acres doesn't really do me any good. I need, I need a few thousand acres. In our case, it was 4,000, where on paper, I had enough material that when I found a customer that wanted to buy a product that I could make, when that customer says, well, can I get this 365 days a year? The answer has to be yes. Otherwise, I'm not really a player in the US economy. It's, it's a pet project. Um, so this critical mass is really important to, to get these, these projects mo moving. So, so that's what we did. Um, uh, BCAP supported, we were a BCAP project area five in 2012. We planted 4,000 acres. Uh, we had to wait a few years. Uh, we pivoted away from renewable liquid fuel. That's a pretty long story. Uh, we started to look at what the fiber qualities were of this crop. We did a bunch of R&D over a couple years, and what we figured out um, was there's actually uh, enormous opportunity in the bio-based markets. So our first manufacturing plant was built in 2014, uh, selling absorbents. Not a real exciting product, but it turns out that Miscanthus absorbs four times its own weight in oil. And there are thousands of uses uh, for mixing off uh, our absorbent with different products and industries and can help them with a more cost-effective cleanup uh, method. So that's been a pretty big deal for us. What that's allowed us to do is um, uh, buy all of our farmers' crop, keep the project stable, and now we get to go for more exciting products like the products these gentlemen were describing a few minutes ago. So our, our next step was we learned how to pulp miscanthus, non-wood pulp, and then, uh, so this isn't at scale. You can't do 1,000 tons a day like our traditional pulp mills in the United States or around the world. We figured out how to do it uh, 10 tons a day uh, economically. So what do you do with pulp at 10 tons a day? Well, we decided to go into molded fiber food service packaging. 99% uh, of the food service packaging in this country that's green and sustainable is actually coming from Asia. And the industries that are buying these products say, look, we will buy literally hundreds of millions and billions of pieces of this stuff, but it's got to be made in the USA. So there is uh, great market opportunity here uh, for, for molded fiber packaging. So what we did is we, we cobbled together enough funding to do six manufacturing lines. It's about 60 million pieces a year uh, with our pulp mill. We put together a uh, rural development loan guarantee, the BNI program, to guarantee our equipment. That was critical. The project would not have happened without the rural development uh, loan guarantee. We did an SBA loan guarantee on the real estate. Jobs Ohio uh, chipped in some loan dollars. And Ashtabula 503, our local economic development, uh, put in CDBG uh, economic development dollars. So we put all that together. We launched this uh, project. Uh, we then flailed around for about two years, uninstalling and reinstalling all the equipment, redoing all the engineering, and redoing all the material flow. Uh, total nightmare. But that's what you have to do in this industry. There's nobody to call. There's no experts. Uh, this is the first facility in the world that's been built like this. So we had to fight through all of our own problems. Uh, this last quarter, we got everything figured out. We are now going to expand from six to 30 lines in the next year. So we are going to be going from 70 full-time jobs to 250 full-time jobs. Uh, there's another announcement that we're going to make in a few months that's going to has related products to this that we're not ready to talk about yet, but we're going to be bumping up to around 750 to 800 jobs in the next few years. All of this is because of BCAP. It's all built on that crop subsidy to get these these crops up and off the ground. So, a pretty big deal. Um, now, what we're really excited about is interesting enough was just mentioned in uh, two speakers ago uh, by John. Uh, with cellulosic nanocrystals. Um, so think of rebar for concrete. You put rebar in concrete, you make it you know, much stronger. On the cellular level, if you can isolate the nanocrystals in living organisms, you can put that product into plastics, foams, gels, paints, shampoos, and you can increase the performance of those products significantly. You can make them more sustainable uh, and create you know, all kinds of new products. Well, it turns out that the aspect ratio of Miscanthus CNCs is bigger and thicker than anything they've seen so far in nature. Three weeks ago, we found out that we got the patent uh, to produce CNCs out of Miscanthus. So now we're starting to get into some really advanced materials and advanced manufacturing, again, built off of, of BCAP. We're working with Argonne National Lab, uh, University of Chicago, and Case Western University in Ohio to commercialize this as quickly as possible. We see the, we see the potential to build dozens of manufacturing facilities producing CNC's because there's literally hundreds if not thousands of products that CNC's can improve. So again, this is all built off of BCAP. We have lots of other products we want to get into development. Um, so so the, the vision I want to try to get across here is this is 4,500 acres. Miscanthus can be grown on 40 million idle acres in the Midwest and Far West. And that's just our crop. There's over 20, 30 good energy crops that are out there, perennial crops that BCAP can support. 
So if we've created, you know, about 70 full-time jobs and we're going to go to 250 jobs off 4,500 acres, you know, what's the potential here? The $5 million that, was, uh, that came into our project generated $25 million in private investment dollars. So there's a five to one ratio right now. We're uh, in the market right now to raise another 40 million in, in private capital. So there's gonna be a 65 million to five million ratio, private to public dollars here. Uh, so it's a, it's a good investment. Um, we have over 125 farming families at this point that are generating revenue from this crop, both landowners and farmers. We've had dozens of families tell us that this is helping them keep the farm in their families. Uh, you have marginal soils, if you don't, keep crops on your land, you lose your tax break, you know, can't really, it doesn't make sense to keep the farm anymore. So there's a lot of farm, farm uh, uh, comp, or, sorry, there's a lot of farm families that we've talked to that have, have kept the farms in the family because they have miscanthus growing uh, on their fields now. So there's a, there's a pretty big impact there. I've already covered these other issues. So what we're talking about here is, is commercializing crops, new crops for the farming community, right? So. Whatever happens to Alatera and whatever we end up doing uh, in the industry, Miscanthus is now commercial. You can, you, can, uh, you can plant it for $500. So I'm very confident because Miscanthus can do anything that a tree can do and actually replace a lot of petroleum products, that in 10, 20 years, Miscanthus is gonna be in um, hundreds of products. Just like we saw corn develop, you know, and soybeans. They started one or two products, now they're in thousands of products. So BCAP can continue to commercialize new crops increase the portfolio of crops for our farming community, and now they've got more and more crops that they can use to diversify their risk and their commodities. Um, and then companies like mine are gonna come in and look at this portfolio of crops that are commercial, and then we can create a bunch of advanced materials, products, et cetera, and build more manufacturing facilities. So that's our story. Uh, we think BCAP's great, and we, we, hope, uh, we hope it continues to get significant funding so this can keep going. Greetings. My name is Graham Christensen. Um, I'm also going to show how uh, parts of the energy title are good for small business people. Um, I am one of those farmers that's always looking to diversify our operation. I come from a family farm in Nebraska. Uh, this is our, uh, I'm a fifth generation farmer and this is our 150th anniversary year since we have first homesteaded. And um, also I'm a, I'm a young rural entrepreneur. I uh, have a, a small uh, contracting company that develops solar and systems and alternative energy projects uh, called GC Revolt. Uh, and it's, it's a, I also have another business that dives a little bit further into the environmental uh, uh, side of things as well. Um, but since in just under three years uh, so far, we have, uh, the, my, my company has developed 25 systems. Um, and uh, what, what we're finding out let me actually rewind one. Let me talk a little bit about what REAP is actually about first. Um, the Renewable Energy for America program is the one that I have the most experience in, in dealing with at, at my business. And what, what happens with uh, REAP is it's for grants and loan guarantees to farmers, ranchers, and small businesses. And it's also a, a cost share for installing a variety of renewable energy systems. This is, this is the portion that we're utilizing a lot in Nebraska right now. Um, what is it used for specifically? Biomass, geothermal, hydro, uh, wind energy, and solar energy, and also energy efficiency is a, is a big component of that as well. So as I was saying a, a bit ago, about, 20, about 25 systems we have put up in just under three years. Uh, and this is in Nebraska with a trickling of projects uh, going across the river into Iowa. And the interest level is really exploding. Uh, without having to do a, a whole lot of marketing, I'm getting calls uh, and interest all the time on this. Uh, farmers are moving in this direction because we're starting to cross over. It's starting to make a lot of fiscal sense. Um, for example, at this time, I can develop a project for about five cents per kilowatt hour over 25 years. S just a straight fixed price is because that project's been paid for. Currently in Nebraska, utility bills are about 10 cents per kilowatt hour with inflation. So you can see how you start diving into that um, that uh, uh, the getting a good return on investment on, on your project uh, due to those numbers. So this is the, actually the first project that I ever did. And uh, it, the REAP program, of course, was utilized on this project. Uh, so this, my first project probably 
in, in small part was actually due to being able to have a program that paid for more of the upfront cost. Uh, because when you purchase a solar system, you usually have a heavy upfront cost, and that can be one of the restrictive factors. This helps us, these grants help us be able to, to alleviate some of those financial pressures and, and coming from a, a, you know, a rural conservative area, um, every penny really counts on these independent business type operations. So folks are very interested in this. On this uh, Brumman project is a $40,000 price tag and, and you can see that we were able to get a grant of about $9,900 uh, to alleviate some of those upfront pressures. And, uh, and also to point out that uh, the rest of those monies um, end up going to a lot of different areas, electrical contractors, um, in some case, we have uh, banks um, that are being involved in financing these programs. Uh, the, the two part-time employees that, that work with me, uh, equipment uh, costs, and of course, also sales tax, you know, which is going to a lot of other things in our state. Uh, this was an award winner uh, through the USDA program, and this one further gives you an idea of how many different kinds of people get involved in a in a project like this um, that was priced you know, around that, between that 80 and $90,000 area. And once again, for this small rural business, this is a, this is a nursery, uh, and uh, my friend uh, Jenny helped establish this. This was her dream for rural entrepreneurship. Um, she built this nursery right on the farm. Uh, without this, this grant, uh, this, this group wouldn't have been pulled together, and these new revenues uh, you know, wouldn't have ever existed. And of course, you have to practice what you preach. So just this uh, couple days before Easter, uh, this, is, this is our uh, family farm, and, and this is uh, our brand new system. We just fired one up ourselves. Um, and uh, we're using that to not only power the farm, but also power an electric vehicle fleet um, uh, that helps us get around from place to place in, in, in northeast Nebraska. And I've also worked a little bit uh, with the wind energy component of the REAP program. Uh, this picture you're seeing right here, this is a group of farm family investors that put up some risk money in order to uh, try to move forward on a community project. Um, and uh, this grant was for $12,500. It was specifically focused on the feasibility as aspect of the grant, meaning that we bought a meteorological tower. We started testing the wind speeds on the high ridge in, in our area. Uh, found out we had great wind potential, and so now we've made friends with a, a bigger company uh, in which is working with us to drive in uh, a wind project into the Burt County area, um, which uh, will help bring new tax revenues um, into our area, which are really important right now. There's a lot of property tax pressure on the farmer in Nebraska, so uh, this helps alleviate some of those pressures or it gets us started down that road. Uh, also, um, this, uh, as we sold some of that wind data to the bigger company, we still have intentions of taking this to the next step and actually develop, developing a, a community scale project that serves our community and allows for more local investment. So we're all about trying to drive revenue centers back home, and especially at a time when commodity prices are low, we're looking for all these kind of unique and creative opportunities uh, that we can find. So what's the value proposition of REAP? You've heard some of that already, um, but these are new jobs, new rural entrepreneurial opportunities that are desperately needed, uh, new revenue streams for rural businesses. Uh, this is lowering our price of electricity for the long term. Uh, so, you know, um, being not even 40 yet, I'm still looking, you know, 40, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. How can we lock in and solidify consistent and low price energy this helps us get a step closer to that. And, um, and uh, also energy security. Uh, we don't spend enough time talking about energy security, but the more distributed energy projects we have, uh, the, the, the more secure our communities and our families will be. And then REAP also does help um, alleviate some of the cost differences that we're still dealing with, with the lithium ion batteries, the Tesla power walls, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of interest for this in, in, uh, in rural Nebraska. You talk about an independent family farmer and the independent mindset, well, they'd, they'd like to be able to produce energy themselves and not have any kind of concerns about way on the edge of the line in these remote areas when the grid reliability is not great, they still want to produce energy. Uh, some of the farms we work with have cold storage to store food and keep it fresh. If the energy goes down, they're out of business. 
And so the battery helps retain that consistency in the grid. Uh, and it's, it's, such a great, it's such a great mix with solar systems right now in rural areas. Uh, we have a ton of interest here. And, and, it's, and, and while solar systems have started to decline rapidly in price, the battery systems are not that way yet. So this program helps us get our foot in the door so that we can start learning about the next wave of technology also. And I actually have an application in right now that would be uh, starting to look at how we apply our first a lithium ion battery uh, to, a, to an organic farm in the far reaches of the state and the Nebraska Panhandle. Uh, no emissions and no water, of course, is a, is a big deal. Um, we have to be cognizant about our environment. That's why I set up business to try to help farmers be in the lead role instead of on the other side of things while making fiscal sense, while proving an economic case, while driving in revenues into, into our state and our home communities. Um, and we talked about also funds, uh, this funds the front, front end costs, which sometimes is tough for people to make. So this is a very important program. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased that everybody's here to learn about this. But um, uh, the energy title does a lot for my home community. So I um, look forward to talking about that a little bit more even. Uh, hi, I'm Jim Duffy. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm a, a lawyer in private practice with the law firm Nixon Peabody based in Boston. But I'm here today in my capacity as a board member of the Distributed Wind Energy Association, where I'm also on their executive committee and secretary of the board. Um, and that's me without a beard. Um, as you can see from the uh, picture there and from other pictures we have, a lot of what Distributed wind energy is is not your 200 megawatt wind farms. It's small on-site installations, uh, whether residential, school, commercial, remote, military farms, probably being the largest uh, public buildings uh, and uh, remote foreign areas. There are a lot of places where small distributed wind facilities exist right now. And the consortium of the people involved, now you've probably never heard of any of the names of the companies up here, but uh, there are a lot of small businesses all over the country that are involved in manufacturing, installation, uh, maintenance, uh, and financing of, uh, of small wind. Uh, so the, it's a decent sized association with quite a few members. Um, so, uh, the benefits of, of distributed wind really are, it, it helps economically distressed areas. Uh, farms being one of the primary ones, uh, farmers with a, a small wind facility on their farm can save, uh, you know, depending on the wind regime in the area, can save significant amounts on their energy bill by generating it themselves and using it on site, or by uh, having uh, an, uh, a third party come in and build it and sell the energy at below what the what the utility would charge. And we all know how farms are uh, stressed for income these days. Um, it, 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 it contributes to uh, American manufacturing. Uh, unlike some of the larger wind turbines, uh, the small ones are, according to DOE, uh, the small and medium sized turbines are approximately 90% domestic content. Uh, there are manufacturing facilities by some of the members of our association in the previous slides uh, to produce uh, all around the country. Uh, uh, Berkey Wind Power in Oklahoma City, uh, Norman, Oklahoma, actually. Uh, Northern Wind Power up in Vermont. And both of those do a significant amount of export to uh, Europe and Asia as well uh, to benefit the U.S. economy. Um, so... Uh, Distributed wind, like distributed renewable energy everywhere, uh, strengthens the grid. It requires less use of the grid because the certain amount of, of energy is generated on site and doesn't have to travel through the grid, minimizes necessary grid upgrades. It has huge potential. The DOE and uh, national laboratories uh, last year said there were 50 million potential sites in the country with, where they deemed it was most likely sufficient wind to economically put small wind on small small businesses, perhaps on larger residences. Uh, they're in all 50 states, and it's one of the major undeveloped national resources that we could capture. It's, it's right there for the taking. Now, um, we've had several policy objectives at DeWea to make, to make this happen. One was to um, grow the R&D uh, budget at the DOE, which fortunately in the recent budget uh, 
uh, uh, enactment uh, provided $10 million for distributed wind R&D. That has been tremendously helpful in rapidly bringing down uh, the costs of producing on-site wind, uh, more and more efficient machines, uh, thorough testing of these machines to certify that they work and that they produce the benefits anticipated. Uh, extended USDA REAP fundings, you know, Graham just talked a lot about REAP. We're here to support the entire energy title, but in particular the, the REAP project which uh, Distributed Wind has utilized. Um, and particularly for underserved technologies. Now, what I mean by that, and I think a lot of, a lot of our speakers, there's a theme here, we've got new innovative uh, ways to produce energy or to, or to benefit uh, farms that perhaps don't have a 20-year track record. So perhaps the official at the state who's allocating REIT money might not be able to as easily justify these projects. We're hoping that going forward there could be a little more flexibility in REIT funding so it can be a nimble program and reward proven but still relatively new technologies and improvement on existing technologies. I think that's sort of a common theme and what we're all hoping to be able to do here. And I think that's really where the government should be stepping in and helping where people are coming up with something innovative. Uh, at Distributed Wind, we were, hope, you know, we, we were one of the so-called orphan technologies that didn't get our federal tax credit extended a couple of years ago. Recently, we've got a better system uh, although it's still not fully uh, parity with solar, so we have a, we're very thankful for what the Congress did in the budget bill, but hoping to make it pure, true parity going forward. Um, we've worked on, on tax reforms every year, on USDA programs every year. A couple of examples up here. Uh, I mentioned uh, the scoring techniques where we're hopeful that newer and more innovative, although proven technologies, will not necessarily be hurt by not having a, a long track record. Um, and we support full funding of the energy title and the REAP program uh, on those bases. Uh, we would also hope that uh, the categorical, ex categorical exclusion for small systems, which is granted to small solar in the current program, would be extended to other technologies like wind, so we don't have to go through onerous environmental documentation on small on-site installation installations. And we hope that Made in America is a consideration. Um, these, the small wind really is uh, soup to nuts manufactured in the United States. Uh, we manufacture a lot more here than we actually use here because of the exports. Um, one way, you know, we're really cutting edge in small wind is because the projects are so small, it has been very difficult to get financing for them. Banks don't, you know, I'm sure Graham's experienced this too, Graham so, banks don't want to make a $10,000 loan to a small business. Uh, so we have recently uh, done larger portfolios with the financing with major banks and insurance companies. That's really only in the first or second year. Uh, we recently did one with over 100 small wind turbines installed on farms in upstate New York uh, with some help from the New York Green Bank. Uh, we think more of that can be done as we get more and more efficient technology and uh, sufficient support from REAP and the energy title generally to move us forward. Thank you. Thank you. And our, uh, someone from EESI wanted to let me tell you in the audience that there are, we ran out of slides outside, but they will be on our website if you're interested in accessing them later. But uh, thank you to our speakers. That was a great sort of display of the variety of technologies and end uses that are possible because of the energy title. And I was really struck in listening to the presentations today that they not only are replacements for traditional products and fuels, but they are better replacements. Um, so with that, I want to open it up to questions from the audience and see if we can start a good discussion. We have one question in the front here, and I ask that you wait until the microphone reaches you so that also the folks joining online can hear us as well. Hello, I'm a, 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 ta a taxpayer who supports the free enterprise system and smaller government. And the question, and the question I have is number uh, two, is two part. Number one, are you saying that if you had to rely on the free enterprise system for your, uh, for your customer base without subsidies and mandates, your businesses would not exist? And number two is, We've heard today about how um, the subsidies and mandates benefit, you know, the farmers and workers in America. But I like, but I like to know, 
how you feel that the sub these subsidies and mandates will benefit the much larger group of taxpayers and consumers who have to pay for them. Thank you. So I think the question we can distill down to kind of what is, and then it's actually a question I had, what beyond, you know, we've talked a lot about the benefit to rural communities, to farmers of these programs, but kind of let's talk about the broader benefits to the general populace. You know, most people don't, don't live in rural America. Most of us live in urban areas. So what are the benefits to the rest of America of these programs? John, go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. Uh, I know what we... Uh, what you're hearing here is a broad range of companies uh, with different types of requests uh, for support on it. Um, I can say for our company, we were privately funded. We did not receive uh, government uh, supports on it uh, to, to grow our business. Um, and when you look at the benefits that we have in terms of uh, 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 being able to advance off into safer chemicals, uh, have less environmental accumulation of, of chemicals out there, um, the ability to have products that are out there do actually, I think, benefits uh, more the urban areas where the issue of safer chemicals and accumulation of uh, plastics uh, and whatnot actually probably has a much bigger impact in the, in, uh, in, in the uh, urban areas um, in terms of the type of materials that we deal with, um, the, the, being uh, safer and less environmental accum accumulation in it. And again, uh, we exist as a private company. Um, you know, we have always existed as a private company, uh, not dependent on government subsidies on it, but, but again, to be able to extend the benefits to a broader range of people, um, there's a specific need um, for assistance and capital in it um, that, that would be the, 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 uh, uh, on the risk capital side of it. Graham? I, I appreciate that question. Um, I would advocate, you know, uh, before cutting or discriminating against one type of energy source versus the other, you know, an all across the board elimination of subsidy systems because these programs are getting way less taxpayer funded subsidies than a lot of the typical energy sources um, that, you're, that you're used to. So uh, it artificially deflates the price of energy. Uh, you know, something even all across the boards, one way or the other, is something that I've always been a big advocate for. Um, and also, uh, as far as, you know, you go, uh, you, wherever you live, if it's in the, here in Washington, D.C., or, or, um, or, you know, maybe you're back home from somewhere in Chicago, or in, in our case, Omaha, when we get a wind project into the ground, um, that means that a lot of times we're selling it to Omaha Public Power District in our area. So now we've locked in the lowest form of energy we can, at least as far as wind energy goes, and that means that's solidified for 25 years is about the life of a lot of the wind projects now. So we, we've ensured that you're going to be paying lower electricity bills for a longer time, um, and that's huge. I already talked about the different jobs that come with the investment that this is about financing, contracting, electricians, surveyors, um, and, and more investment opportunities at the most local levels. Uh, we don't have a lot of you know revenue opportunities where I'm from, so um, you know these are these are needed in our area if we're even going to keep our community around. Um, and then finally, uh, as as we start to um, move further down our life, some of these environmental impacts from some of these other um, uh, sources of energy are also causing health issues. And those are bills that become harder and harder to pay all the time. So if we can have a preventative approach to health issues, we also eliminate those costs in the, in the long run. Uh, you know, you look at it in that sense and you take all of the dollar bills that are factored into us and you can see how you can make a pretty good case. Great, questions? Back here. Hello. Um, I was wondering if the panel has found any crops specifically grown for either energy purposes or for bioproduct purposes that could also double as maybe a cover crop that could be planted in off growing seasons and then also sold um, to companies like yourself. So if, if, if let, let's say you're a farmer and you grow a specific crop or do you crop rotations? Is there any way that these, these crops, maybe not something like a willow tree that could take a couple of years to grow, but have, have you guys found any kind of crops that could grow within, let's say four months during an off growing season that could then be sold? Well, uh, I haven't 
found a crop specifically that you, you're asking about. Um, what, what we have, and it, this, this would take R&D dollars, but what we have played around with a little bit with some of our farmers is the idea of intercropping while these, uh, these crops need time to mature. So a lot of these uh, promising perennial crops need two, three, four years to mature. And while they're doing that, as you, as you probably are well aware, you've got weed control issues and you've also just you have lost that land during that time. So um, I actually talked to a guy in Illinois for a while that was planting uh, rows of corn in between his miscanthus and was finding some success. I don't know exactly where all that went, but I think there's a really, it's a really interesting question in terms of can you, can you double crop or do some inter-row cropping for a couple of years while that, while that perennial crop uh, matures? And I think that's a, that's a really interesting uh, concept that we look at. But in terms of cover crops, I haven't, I haven't seen anything yet, but uh, maybe that, yeah. John, did you want to add anything? About the, about the only thing I, I would add on that is, is that we're really at the very beginning of this. Uh, that's what's exciting about it, and that's why doing things that we can in order to provide promotion for these and creating the perception that these products are actually can be superior, I think is, is really key because then what that does is that drives investment, interest, and excitement in really looking for those. And as I mentioned, for a company like DuPont, scale is very important when we're going to do things on a, on, a, on a large scale. So you'd have to have you know, a crop base that would, that would have sufficient just mass and quantity and, and collectability in order to be um, viable. That said, there's always uh, an interesting perspective of unique molecules or unique. So that's where I think that partnership between growers, I and mean, we've seen it in a lot of other industries, more in the food industry. Um, and, and I think that as, as these products, as we start to understand more the relationship between the raw material source and then what's potential, I think there's an awful lot of, of future potential of, of specialty products that are being driven for specialty chemicals as either replacements or uh, what would be much better is something that's even more benign and superior in, in property. So we're at the very beginning of this, but I think that's why it's so crucial that programs like this are supported because you need successes, you need wins, and we have a tendency, we're going to go after the, uh, not to make a bad joke, the lower hanging fruit, but, uh, but I think it's important that we win with this and, and we establish a preference for these materials and, and then I think the, the rest will follow. Great. Questions? Yes, we got one right up here in the front. Oh, I'm scratching my ear. Oh, no, right behind you. <laughs> Hi, uh, John Kinese. I'm an energy policy consultant. Um, it's really a question about uh, distributed power um, coupled with storage, um, I think is a very important element to expand it to get the most benefit out of it. Uh, do you see a lot of competition because of large suppliers that are buying up the technology for, uh, you know, areas in Nevada, et cetera, compared to, you know, these smaller, um, smaller installations? And you see that as uh, an impediment for even further expansion. It, it is an issue currently uh, in a place like Nebraska. Um, first. One of the first things everybody talks about after the solar is the Tesla power wall. And I've called all around the country. Denver and Minneapolis are the closest uh, outlets, you know, for Nebraska. And they're not interested in the market here right now. So the thing that people most identify with is not very accessible. Um, uh, so we're looking at alternatives. But, you know, being that the, the um, technology is, you know, still somewhat new, we got a pretty good idea what we're doing. But... Uh, there's, there's not a lot of other options that are really credible, but it's changing. Um, I, you know, I, I think every time somebody asks me about it, we take another peek and, and there's something kind of new floating around out there. Um, uh, but, you know, currently, uh, while the solar system seems like it's uh, you know, a lot more easy to justify, the battery is still a little too pricey. So I'm hoping we can get a little bit more focus on kind of those independent business owners in the Midwest, because uh, there definitely is interest. But um, we're probably going to need to, to uh, make sure that we have some support system to get the first ones out there so people can grow comfortable. 
Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of these decisions are made locally, on site by individual farmers or businesses. I think the storage is clearly coming, it's getting better, but the cost curve is coming down pretty quickly on storage. And I think a lot of people are waiting on the storage component um, until the costs come down further and it becomes even more uh, attractive price-wise. Uh, but it's coming and it's, it's gonna be part of this. We could also use, you know, right now there's a, um, there's a tax credit subsidy for the energy equipment itself, and there's some uncertainty whether storage is energy equipment or not. And uh, it would be very helpful, the IRS is studying the question, has been for several years. It would be very helpful to get an answer on that. We have a question over here. This follows up a little bit on the previous question, and it's more of a plug than a, than a question. Um, so I'm in, Pete Wyckoff. I'm the new energy policy advisor for Minnesota Senator Tina Smith. And we just dropped a bill, S2619, that would reauthorize the uh, Farm Bill Energy title. And it takes, takes out a lot of what I'm hearing today and puts it in the bill. And one of the things we would do would be to allow uh, combined storage and production as a REAP eligible thing to do. So if this is your sort of thing, I would encourage you to take a look at our bill um, and, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Pete. And there's also copies of the bill, I believe, outside on the table if you're interested in taking a look. There's a question over here in the middle. Hey, uh, can you talk about the role of state government in conjunction with federal policy in terms of how it helps drive innovation or farmers? Well, I, I will say that where there is a state encouragement, that's where you see more going on. Graham and I were talking about it at lunch today, and um, there are certain jurisdictions where you see more than others, and it's often where there is a, a state incentive that, that um, goes with the federal incentive to make it more attractive. I don't know if you, there are plenty of examples. Unfortunately, the, like the federal, the state changes year to year and certain states are more attractive or less attractive from year to year. At the state level in Nebraska, we're having a lot of trouble getting traction on anything renewable energy uh, to kind of put us in the forefront of this right now. So. We become somewhat a little bit, um, you know, more in tune with federal programs, uh, and and there's there's some things that have allowed us to get the foot in the door, but uh, there's still some restrictions there, so we're being held back. So, um, you know, it's it's important to be looking at it from both lenses, but you know, I, I don't think Nebraska is the only state across the middle of the country that is is really having troubles being able to have a, a intellectual conversation on on uh, these new energy sources. Just to follow on, on to that. On, on the state side, just one, you know, we get a lot of calls because people would love us to go move to their state and create jobs in another state. And when I take those calls, I say, well, what are the incentives? And they say, well, we'll give you tax incentives. I say, you realize you're calling New Hampshire where the live for your die. I say, we don't have taxes in the first place, so what you're offering me really doesn't help. So uh, we've decided we located in the right place the first time uh, in terms of state, state, state support, which we just don't have income taxes. Sorry to interrupt. I, I do want to speak to that a little bit. Just I can only speak from our personal experience, but I will say that um, so the, the administration in the state of Ohio right now uh, has a program called Jobs Ohio. That's the economic development wing in the state of Ohio. And uh, they uh, contributed a $1.25 million loan to our um, uh, pulp and molded fiber packaging plant. And th that, that additional loan was critical. The project would not have gotten off the ground with, you know, without that piece of it. And you know, I give them credit uh, because you know, that economic development arm looks at this very similar to the way a bank looks at these projects. So you know, it's, it's fairly stringent criteria. And you know, they still um, you know, took some risk uh, in, in supporting our project because they believed in what they were able to do for a rural community in Northeast Ohio. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a small sample size there, but the state of Ohio has, you know, helped get this project off the ground. And, you know, we believe, uh, we're hoping that, you know, the tax dollars going back there now are, are making, making it worth it, so. 
Uh, just a follow on to Graham in particular, uh, why the resistance in uh, Nebraska in particular is not the, the, the uh, lure of you know, jobs, economic development, particularly in rural areas, having any impact at all? Why, why the resistance at uh, the state level? It's, it's tough to make um, complete sense out of it, um, but uh, there's, there's just not a complete understanding of things yet, I don't, I don't think. I, don't, I, don't, I also don't think that um, folks are grasping the enormous amount of potential that this has for, for rural um, at this time. Uh, so um, we continue to go about doing the educational process, you know, things like today um, back home. And, uh, you know, once in a while we, uh, we make some progress there. But overall, um, that combined with a, uh, a really strong, you know, rural elect electric association, you know, push um, on some other forms of energy has it's, it's made it a little bit more difficult to move forward as aggressively as, as we need to to take full advantage of this, this new business opportunity. Questions? I had a question for jo either of the Johns. I don't know if you could speak to this for me. I was wondering kind of where are we now in terms of the renewable chemical market today and kind of what's, what is the growth potential in terms of renewable chemicals? Can you give me a sense of kind of, of what the potential is? As I said, I think in, in general, I think we're really just the, at the tip of the iceberg because um, a lot of these um, chemicals are, are genuinely unique, and so it's, it's more than just the replacement. Um, it really does open up new markets uh, on the Serona side, on the um, propendiol. I mean, we've been extremely successful, uh, and that's just one. Uh, you know, we, we definitely see the opportunity for whole new platforms, and uh, so, I, you know, um, Personally, I'm quite bullish on it. I mean, I think it, it really has, uh, it's actually just begun. Um, what makes, what, for an example, what makes propendiol unique is that it has three carbons. Well, uh, anything coming out of petroleum has to be divisible by two. So what makes three unique is it's a, it's a helix, it's a coil. Uh, it's kind of unique in nature. So a chemical that we knew how to make uh, synthesizing from a petroleum base, we knew about it. I mean, DuPont had invented it back in the, I think, 47 or something like that. It was really expensive to make. So as you start to play around with plant base and, and take a look, it opens up whole new unique molecules that are far superior, and ironically, it's, it's, a, it's a very low energy way of making it. So um, this is just in, you know, if, if you look at just the total history of it, uh, when Tim Gerke from DuPont, you know, first thought about this back in, I think it was 93 or somewhere, and then he was all excited around the halls, oh, wow, this is, this is just all out there, this three carbon molecule, and, and that's just one when you look at what it spurred. So uh, there's so many more, so many more areas and potential, and uh, so I, I think we're only at the, at the very start. Cool. John? I totally agree. Um, I think, uh, and it really speaks back to the need to expand, from my, my perspective, the 903 into broader areas. Um, I think there has been a wave over the last uh, 10, the, the initial wave was just to have a renewable version of an existing chemical. And uh, billions of dollars was invested in it, and I said, well, why, why do that? I mean, I, I don't understand what the value of it is. Whereas what you're seeing now, those of us who've survived and have prospered are coming out with a totally novel chemistry with far greater value than just being renewable. As I spoke about, you know, they're safer chemicals. They have lower VOCs. They have uh, less harmful to the environment, less harmful to, to human exposure. Um, they don't accumulate in the environment. Um, these, are, these are far, far more um, important uh, and valuable goals to go after than just whether it's from a renewable biomass. So I think I, I totally agree with John, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, we're going to look back and see that there'll be a range of probably 20 to, a, 20 to at least 30 fundamentally new chemistries that come out 
that are total breakthroughs uh, in terms of uh, the, benef the benefits to the end products, to consumer end products, industrial end products, and that, we improve, and that they're safe, safer, to, uh, safer chemicals to use and that they have less impact on the environment. And we're still very early in those stages. Great. Um, I, I think it's important in both wind and solar, as prices come down and as machines get more efficient and less costly, more and more areas open up where you can, you can effectively use them. We're now doing wind in areas that were considered not windy enough 10 years ago, but with the new machines and the costs coming down, they can be done there. So I don't think we know the full extent of it yet. It's still relatively uh, new. Great. Any other questions? Yes. Um, hi. You can just state, state your question if it's not working. Uh, yeah, Todd Yost here. I'm representing the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, this question is for Graham, but anybody else can chip in. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that you were able to use uh, REAP to help uh, use uh, energy efficiency upgrades to HVAC and lighting and whatnot. Uh, I'd just like to wonder, you know, uh, how. Um, you know how that's worked out for you. Uh, what exactly you what exactly you did, and um, the benefits that you've seen accrue from that uh, up to this point. To to be honest, I haven't specifically worked on one of those programs. I just wanted to make sure it was highlighted. Um, but the energy efficiency pieces is big of a piece of anything of this. And I imagine as we expand in the future years, we're going to be trying to take a look at how we pair these things to bring energy usage down and then match solar, you know, and then of course that lowers the cost of, of everything all the way around. So uh, there's a lot of need for this in rural areas. There's been some utilities that have gone forth and moved um, on these programs. They're popular when they do, um, but uh, I, you know, that is something that I think is vital, but you know, we haven't used it um, ourselves with our business yet. Are there any questions on BCAP specifically? I know we haven't really talked about BCAP. Uh, Sarah, can you are you guys looking at other regions or feedstocks for re-energy, or are you just focusing on shrub willow? Um, at this point, only shrub willow. We have been thinking about whether there's any BCAP potential um, at our four plants in Maine. In fact, I was just talking to Scott about that earlier today. Uh, we're also looking at you know potentially finding a bio-based manufacturer to co-locate with us at our four plants in Maine. So. I'm looking forward to spending time with my colleagues after this session to talk to them more about that. But, you know, we really represent the entire value chain of the bioeconomy here. And I think that's also important to point out. I mean, we're all important to the bioeconomy in a different way. Questions? Uh, it wouldn't be fair to give everybody a question from me. So, Scott, are you using the BioPreferred Labeling Program? Yes, uh, you can <clears throat> search our name in the database right now, and um, we uh, applied our pulp as an intermediate, so anything that you make our pulp out of uh, is eligible for the program. So can you explain, I don't think we exactly explain, for those of you who may not know what exactly, you know, what is BioPreferred, kind of what does that label convey, and how, are, how is the federal government using BioPreferred? Uh, you know, I may, I may need to defer to my colleague here. As I recall it, uh, we, we put in an application, we had to do the ASTM standard to verify what the, you know, that this was new carbon and not old carbon. And then once that was verified, there are, there are criteria as to what percentage, you know, of renewable your product needs to, needs to, to be to qualify. And then once you get that designation, um, is, is my understanding the, the federal procurement standard, uh, if you have a product that is, performs equally and pr is priced equally, I think that gives you a competitive advantage uh, to have your product purchased. Is that, is that about right? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so we have used that program. We've, you know, um, and you didn't ask me this question, but I, I will mention. Sure. Uh, we were looking to expand in two more states here in the next few years uh, with, with one of our products. And we're working with a, a large company right now that has a uh, crop that they want to commercialize that's right now a landscaping plant similar to the way Miscanthus was. Uh, and they're looking at a you know, 50,000 acre project. Um, the technology has already been worked out. The end buyer's worked out. The question is how do you, how do you plant 50,000 acres of a crop that hasn't been, you know, hasn't been a crop yet? So um, 
But that's, again, this is happening because they've observed our work and uh, we've been working with them for a couple years. And again, BCAP has generated these other opportunities. Great. Yeah, I've seen that. I don't know if you've been in the stores. Sometimes I get very excited. I see the BioPreferred label on cleansers or all kinds of different products. So it's exciting to see that label grow. Um, maybe someday it'll be just like the organics label. That would be great. But um, are there any other questions from the audience? Well, with that, um, I would like to give a round of applause for our speakers. Thank them for joining us here today.